Merry Christmas and welcome along to the final Zooming with Driven for 2022. It's episode 115. Uh, we have Damien, David, Dean and I am Sam. And the show is brought to you by Honda with the price promise guarantee. Only one price, the best price. And we are counting down the top 10 stories of 2022. We, uh, last week we did 20 to 11. And I've got the list here and I'm really surprised on the story that is number one. We're going to get to that in just a second. But first we are starting with the news. News is that summer is summer is technically here, although it hasn't been here for a lot of the country, oh but summer man. is coming. And there is a new Mazda MX-5. What's better for summer than a Mazda MX-5? So it's a mild update, but it's got a new thing called kinematic posture control. Oh, yeah, I need that. And that is... <laughs> Sit up right here. Yeah. Sits up straight up. And they need an iron as well, quite clearly, but that's that fine. That is a, um, a new kind of driver assistance system. It's a little bit like, you know, torque vectoring by braking, where the car will gently, you know, break yep. one of the wheels to sort of adjust the, the attitude. It's, it's a version of that, but it's a very, very subtle one and it's designed to help the car actually go around. It essentially helps the car go in the direction that the driver is pointing it. And you might, you could probably argue that the MX-5 doesn't need that because it's a fantastic car to drive. Yeah. But it's got it now, it's standard on all the models. Um, it and it's a very, very subtle, you don't feel it, uh, but it's a very subtle little brake it either lightly to just tighten the cornering angle a bit, or under very heavy acceleration and really fast cornering, obviously break it a bit bit more heavily. So that's how it's doing it. It's doing it through breaking yeah. one of the wheels. Yeah, inside so wheel it's wheel. like a rear-wheel drive version of um, Mazda's G-vectoring control. Yeah, right. we talked about, you know, and you've, we're familiar with that. So it's 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 almost like a really subtle version of stability control, I suppose. But it's designed to make the car more fun to drive. It's not yeah. a, not necessarily a safety thing. It's yeah. about making the car better to drive. And along with that, um, we've got a return of the GT model for the MX-5 range. So that's available in the Roadster. And the GT is just a yeah. speckle, special package can't say special. The GT is a special package. It's got fancy wheels. It's got uh, Bilstein sport suspension. It's just got some extra bits and pieces and there's a, a new colour. Yeah, and cool. uh, it's a very cool car and um, MX-5s are always fantastic. They it's just, just an excuse to talk about MX-5s. Yeah, they look great. Hey, the new they ones do. just look fantastic. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dino, what have you got? A couple of quick things. Uh, Waze, uh, that's the other third thing I bang on about uh, in the <laughs> office all the time. W-A-Z-E, please, more more users. It's better than Google Maps. Uh, but we've got a bit of a chat with the Waze New Zealand guys. So Waze is huge. It's a user-based system. uses Google Maps. Uh, you can feed everything from police locations to crashes on the road to accidents to something on the road. Uh, like an object on the road, and it just adds a layer to Google Maps, right. makes it even better. W-A-Z-E, please use it. We've got a full interview coming out, so check that out on Driven pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Really helpful throughout the probably the, the Christmas and school holidays as well, just uh, helping plan drives. You can plan everything, so mm. I won't go into detail. And now, because I've bored everybody enough, no, stupid I love for the that. last I've couple of months. I've got a Waze fact, actually. Um, oh, yeah. Renault in Europe is the first car maker to integrate Waze into its cars. So mm. it now uses Renault, Renault SatNav oh. in Europe, not in New Zealand, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in Europe, um, SatNav in Renault's is now Waze. Can I just get it as a plug-in for the app, or is it a specific app on its own? A specific app on its own. Yeah, yeah wicked. But it will appear on Apple CarPlay and, and yeah. smartphone replication. Ford was one of the first to use it a couple of years ago. I've been using it for probably 15 years mm. in Sydney. Sydney, LA, London, all around the world it works because it's, it's a smartphone app. So it's yeah. fantastic and it cool. works well. Bigger the, bigger the city, the better it works. Yeah. But we'll get onto that another week anyway. Um, I've just I've just flown back, um, what, even more so? <laughs> no, I was, I was just imagining next year us talking about ways again over and over and over again. Every week, it's a weekly occurrence. Yeah. Yep, okay. definitely. <laughs> Um, I've just flown in about 14 hours ago as, as we record this. I've flown in from Adelaide. We had the Hyundai N Festival. Uh, it's a yearly thing that Hyundai Australia uh, puts together. Fantastic event. Gets all Hyundai enthusiastic, performance, passionate owners mm -hmm. who own ends mostly. They don't have to own ends, but certainly are, are end owners, and they all converge on one place. And this year, it was at the Bend, about one and a, a little bit over an hour east of Adelaide in the new Bend Motorsport Park, which is an amazing is facility it? in itself. There's eight different track configurations. The longest is 7.7 .7 kilometres, which makes it the second longest permanent racetrack in the world behind the Nürburgring, yeah. Nordschleife. So we had three, three track configurations to play with on the day. Hyundai gave us, as journos, uh, at the, basically the fleet of ends, i20, i30, Kona, uh, and an and a, um, i45 slash Lantra sedan as well to play with, which is an Aussie only version, but just as good and um, amazing package. Um, I set the record, I did 85 laps of the places uh, in, in the day when the average was about 
10 or 15. <laughs> but when there's cars in the pit lane... <laughs> Way too an, keen! You've yeah. got an open track. <laughs> uh, I can't figure out why you yeah. wouldn't. So it was fantastic. Um, yeah. Um, great event. The end of festival, they had uh, N-Man there, which is not a cheap rip-off of the Stig in any way, shape or form, wearing high no clothes. He's just his own person. And right? uh, was he in uh, Baby Blue? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Walking around doing stick. Uh, end man things. So yeah, um, yeah it was it's just the atmosphere. They had little pedal pedal carts, races in the pits. They oh. had a gym car, a motor car. Are you counting that as your laps to the pedal car races? No, definitely oh, okay. not. Uh, I didn't have to just, when it, when there's an open track there, I uh, didn't even think about the pedal carts. Um, but fantastic. So I got to experience the range. Culminated in driving uh, the RN twenty two E. Seen the pictures. That is a, it's maybe not the world's best named car. However, it does all have a meaning here. It was, it's an evolution of the RM20, which is basically, it's a rolling lab, uh, not Breaking Bad style of rolling lab, but a rolling development lab. <laughs> so R means rolling, N is Hyundai's N division. 22 yeah. means it's actually made in 2022, representative yeah. of the year, and the E is electric. So it's effectively a little bit of a precursor to the Hyundai Ionic 6 that's due out next year. Right. Um, um, Great package. There's only two of these in the world mm. that have been built, and we got to drive it. So, um, yeah. It's, it's obviously a focus on performance. Was it lightning quick? It's built up as a drift car. So yeah. it's got over 400 kilowatts. It was quick, combined, front and yep. rear motor, but it's also got mechanical LSDs in it as well. So it combines, because generally speaking, electric cars have kind of virtually had a motor in each wheel kind of mm. thing to some extent. But this has got motor front and rear, and, it, and it's got a mechanical split. Uh, of left and right. So it's sort of set up the drift. We didn't get a chance to drift, but when you're in one of two prototypes in the world and there's a Korean engineer sitting next to you, yeah. um, it's intimidating enough as it was. But mm. we had two laps of the 7.7 kilometer circuit. Um, yeah, amazing car. They've even simulated a manual transmission in a way in an electric car, which I know sounds odd, but it's with paddle shift. So you did, we did the first lap just in a, in a driving electric mode and you've got that awesome power and the smoothness and it's all quiet. It actually sounds really good as well. It's got this simulated sound to it. Mm -hmm. On the second lap, the engineer just gives you a symbol to, to pull back on both paddles and it changes to manual mode. So simulated manual gears. It actually gives well, you a little bit more yeah. braking, dips the nose down in the corners, and you have to upshift. And it simulates hitting a rev limiter as well. So you sort of go, no, 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 oh, I've got to pull another gear. So Brilliant. it's actually faster in the non-paddle shift mode. It's, a, yeah. it's very much a novelty. Yeah, I'm not sold on that. I mean, that, I think that's the first thing that these electric cars need to do is they need to stop trying to pretend they're, they're petrol cars because they're so good in their own right. Yeah, yeah, they are. I mean, there was a bit of a split decision between the journos who drove it. Yeah. Some said they really liked it. Personally, I didn't. You didn't need it. It was yeah. a redundant thing, and whenever you get a, a like a track thing that you don't need, just don't have it. And yeah. it's, it's probably faster with the electric mode just full electric non-shift mode as well, but mm. amazing experience. So uh, yeah, thanks Hyundai for, for letting us drive the RN22E. Yeah, there will privilege. be a full story up on Driven, if not now, very, very soon as well. So nice the N, uh, N Festival's coming to New Zealand in yeah. 2023 as oh, well. Wonderful, yeah. And so, we, we should congratulate these brands that have performance divisions, because it's what gets us excited, you know? Yeah. It's wonderful. Well done, Hyundai. Uh, Damien. Praga Bohema. Do you know what that is, Sam? Sounds like a nice champagne. It's not. Sounds like a coat. Praga is probably the oldest car maker you've never heard of, which clearly you haven't. No. Um, <laughs> nope. And they have just launched a brand new hypercar to take on the um, world endurance... Uh, thingamajig. Thingamajig, yeah. The um, hypercar series, the new oh, yeah. production-based endurance series. Uh, and they were actually founded in the 1800s as a heavy industrial manufacturer. They made their first car in 1907. Uh, and then post-World War II, the communist government said, you're making trucks from now on. <laughs> Skoda was chosen as the um, car maker. Mm -hmm. This is from Czechoslovakia, by the way. I should have said it at the start. <clears throat> anyway, after communism dropped, they started getting into racing their trucks. So they were doing Dakar rallies and things like that. Then that led them into motocross bikes, then into racing carts. And apparently they're one of the most successful racing cart makers in the world. Right. And um, now they're building a hypercar for the road. Fantastic. And it's a V6 hypercar. Right. But it's the V6 from the Nissan GTR. Oh, wow. Yeah. Looks, looks pretty looks, good too. It looks yeah. awesome. It looks absolutely amazing. I, I love their spirit. I love the fact yeah. they're like forced into building trucks, but no, no. Yeah, no, no, no. We're going to do What else? thing? We love <laughs> racing. We'll race our trucks and we'll hold on to it. Then we'll build supercars in a hundred years time. Yep. Mm. 
Oh, God, look it's at the insane. state of that. It's insane. Hmm. Nissan supply them the engines brand new from the factory. They yep. go off to a, um, a, a famed tuner whose name I can't remember in the UK who completely strips them and rebuilds them. Mm. Uh, and they're expecting about 520 kilowatts from yeah, it. Right. The thing weighs under 1,000 kgs. Yeah, right. so Only about $2 million, dollars, eh? Yeah, it's about $2 million. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some material. <laughs> yeah, lovely. Yeah, wow, what a thing. Absolutely. Awesome. If you're an eight-year-old kid and you're asked to draw a supercar, that's pretty much what you'd draw, eh? Isn't it beautiful? Right, the countdown. Here we go. The top 10 stories of 2022. These are the stories that you clicked on, the most read articles uh, here at driven.co.nz. So let's get into the countdown. Number 10 on the list, the ultimate FEV guide. Every plug-in hybrid electric car and SUV you can buy in New Zealand. Yeah, so we have a rolling kind of guide to BEVs, FEVs and HEVs, hybrid electrified vehicles. Um, and it's just, it's always up to date. So this is just a bit of a plug. If you're actually interested in buying an electrified car of any kind, go to driven.co.nz and look up our ultimate guides. But the FEV is, um, is obvious, the FEV guide has been the top rated one for the year, which is kind of interesting because FEVs are outsold by hybrids <laughs> and BEVs in New Zealand. So there's obviously, that's what people choose to buy, but there's obviously a lot of interest in FEVs. That's why more people have read this guide than any of the others. Um, I guess because it's a good middle ground, FEV, isn't it? Like you get, you get As you it. always say. Yeah, I know. I always say it's the <laughs> ideal thing to try. Don't say it. It's got every single brand new FEV that you can buy in New Zealand with specs and, and guides and, and pictures and things. So go, go have a look. Hmm. I suppose actually out of all three, the FEV is the most misunderstood. Yes. So people I think, are probably yeah. still confused by them. So. Yeah. To compromise, though, wasn't it? Because it's a plug-in. Yeah, you plug it in, but it's also got a combustion. It's the engine, best of so. both worlds, Sam. I guess so. <laughs> Number nine. Here are some of the cheapest petrol stations in New Zealand. That was from June. Yeah, we did this in June, and it's fascinating just to see how the prices fluctuate up and down. And that was a particularly painful time. So uh, obviously a popular story. Uh, probably less so now because we're in a. I wouldn't say it's great, but uh, we probably that three dollar is that magic barrier where people just start to to really panic. <laughs> a little bit. And that's what it was like in June because we did a guide on the cheapest fuel. And just to give you an idea, we used the price tracking app Gaspy, mm -hmm. G-A-S-P-Y. Uh, and just to give you an idea, what are we paying now? Like a $2.60, $2.70, $2.80, give or take? Yeah, but minus a, a portion of the excise tax. Is that right? 25 cents, yeah. yes. So back then in June, uh, just to give us some perspective, uh, the cheapest was $2.90 in Christchurch. Most expensive was $3.11 in Rotorua, so oh. that's what the same sort of 91 octane fuel. I was in Australia last week, $1.60, near the airport. Wow. So the most expensive fuel is always near the airport, where they like to sting you. So that we, we are getting ripped off. This yeah. is just ridiculous, the, the, the fuel price in New Zealand. Yeah. Food and fuel, why is it so expensive when even with the exchange rate, Australian petrol still should be about $1.80, dollar eighty, dollar ninety. I don't know. I, it's, Tell me, Sam. I, Tell don't, me. I literally don't know. And do you know what's about to happen? Is we're hearing murmurings of the government starting to talk about how they can charge for electric vehicles as well. So you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Number eight on the list. Study reveals most loved and hated car brands in New Zealand. Yes, this was actually a global study done by a website called theclunkerjunker.com who buy old crap cars, basically, but they're not in New Zealand. But they did a global study using what they call sentiment AI which sounds, sounds convincing, to track Twitter sentiment across oh, yeah. different yeah. countries mm -hmm. wow. yeah. about certain brands. Yeah. Um, the most, like Tesla was very much a mixed thing. It was the most liked in 21 countries. It was the most disliked in 16 countries. Uh, likewise, Ferrari was the most liked in 10 countries and the most disliked in 18 countries. Wow, But really? in New Zealand, Kia was the most liked. Wow, We wow. like our Kias. Uh, and the most disliked was the BMW, which, you know, I don't think is deserved, but... That's an old chest, though. That is an old chest. Yeah. Yeah. BMW yeah. all the time. So, yeah. and, it, and I also saw some recent research, because we didn't write that story. Uh, we we kind of republished it, but I did see some research, and I think it was based on something uh, like a really low number. So in support of BMW, yes. uh, it was like f minimum of 40 with Twitter followers, so yeah, yeah, there's a right. few little okay. anomalies in yeah. reports I mean, like that. Yeah, we all, all know. of those things are pretty... Well, yeah. to be honest, we all know that um, that title's held by Audi now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm not joking. Uh, number seven, study finds EVs are more harmful to the environment than classic cars. Says the person who used to own an Audi. Yeah, you sold um, yours like a couple of years well, ago. Well, only because the reputation was so terrible. <laughs> this is another old chestnut. People people love uh, seem to love anything that kind of gives um, EVs a bit of a bashing as well. Yeah. This was based 
based on a study by, it was actually a UK um, company called Footman James. They're a classic car insurer, so that will give you a, a, a bit of a hint on, on the direction of the story. Yeah. It was just on the premise that um, classic cars are better for the environment than EVs, and that's because classic cars don't get driven very far, basically, just to boil it right down. The average mileage of a classic car in the UK, according to the study, is about 1,900 kilometres per year. So the argument is you shouldn't feel bad about owning and driving a classic car. No. Because the carbon footprint of an EV, to build it, yeah. you know, okay, zero emissions driving, but it has a huge footprint to actually build the thing. Yeah. They calculated that you'd have to drive your EV about for about 45 years to actually get it down <laughs> to the level of running a classic car. Yeah, but right. it's based on the fact that people don't drive their classic cars very far. No, but also based on the throwaway society. Like, if we actually looked after our things, then we would, yeah, you know, it's, it's a fair point. Good point. Yeah, uh, number six on the list. Uh, a collection of rare cars up for auction after owner was arrested for drug trafficking. Yeah, that's right. So this was a story um, from the US. And it was really interesting, I think, just because of the lineup of cars that were um, that were impounded. He, he was a Twi drug dealer with impeccable taste. He was, yeah, yeah. well, with a lot of money. Um, <laughs> Twenty-seven rear vehicles: um, Toyota Supras, E46 BMW M3s, seventeen Toyota Supras. <laughs> um, oh. So you know, mm. Mitsubishi Lancer Evos. Dean loves those. Um, Nissan 350Zs, BMW M4, all sorts of cool things. Um, an Acura Integra Type R. Honda, so he's obviously. just a Fast and Furious fan. He is a really? Fast and Furious. Yeah. guy and obviously um, had taken to crime to fund his habit but yeah some very cool looking <laughs> like we wouldn't all do the same yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's such a good yes. point uh, number five on the list of the top 10 stories for 2022 parents take dealer to court over teens purchase of a $40,000 Mazda RX-7 yes well this one was I, I, my, as I was reading through it my emotion it was a roller coaster of emotions. My opinion changed multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> this was dealer Nelson Dealer sold a nineteen ninety nine Mazda RX7 to a teenager in October twenty twenty one. He charged him forty grand for it. Mm. Um, now looking like just a quick look on Trade Me today, most Mazda's RX7s from that era are sort of between the forty to a hundred grand mark, depending on how optimistic mm. the owners want to be. A teenager though. Yeah. Um, now, and then it gets murky. He bought it sight oh, yeah. unseen. <laughs> so it was uncomplied. It was a fresh import. Mm. It was uncomplied, so it wasn't road legal. The dealer says, and the tribunal agreed, that he marketed it as, as a project car. So at no stage was he actually saying it was a road legal car. Mm. Um, and then it gets all sort of murky things about how the, the dealer says he knew that there was an adult involved in the the uh, dealings he had with them, whereas the family are now saying, no, the kid just did it on his own and all of this. Um, the dealer says that the family were perfectly happy at the time to hand over the money and buy the yeah, car, right. and now they've changed their mind. And basically the, the um, tribunal in the end said, oh, nah, this is too much for us, and handed it over to the courts. Okay. Uh, and I, again, don't actually know what came of it because I could not find any record anywhere else of what happened. Right. But like I say, you know, the on Trade Me Now, those cars are selling for 40 to 100 grand. Yeah, it's just so it, go to it, it doesn't sort of seem like he got a, a bad deal, mm. but okay. everyone knows if you're lucky enough for your parents to buy you a car when you're a teenager, it should be a Suzuki Swift, and then you wouldn't <laughs> you have these have problems. Two. That's <laughs> it. Forty yeah. grand, you could have two Suzuki. Well, if you went second hand, you could have five. Yeah. Anyway, we move on. <laughs> I'm quite, I guess we're all just a little bit envious of the kid that has more money than us. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Uh, number four on the list, BP and Shell stations sue rival for not charging enough for petrol. <laughs> yeah, so this is two familiar brands, obviously, um, <clears throat> but it's actually an American story, and um, it's the two fuel stations which are next door to a Woodman's in, um, in the US. Now, Woodman's is a regional um, like supermarket outlet. I guess mm -hmm. it's a bit like a Foursquare or something. They also sell petrol. And the two fuel stations, the two fuel providers, um, accused the um, the franchise of un deliberately undercutting them mm -hmm. and selling much cheaper fuel, and they sued them. Yeah. Right. Isn't that just business? <laughs> well, Sell it they, cheaper than your they were arguing, and I think the um, I think the lawsuit's still ongoing. There hasn't actually been a, an outcome that I'm aware of. But um, there's a it's in Wisconsin, and there's an unfair sales act in Wisconsin which yeah. covers stuff like this. So. Well, it sounds like the yeah. same old problem of fuel companies, you know. Yeah. Having conversations collusion. about yeah, yeah collusion yeah. On, on, on prices. Yeah. So I guess the opposite uh, opposite applies. Yeah, if, yeah. if someone's deliberately undercutting you. Yeah. Yeah. Number three on the list. We're into the top three right now. Uh, video footage of a hidden mobile of hidden mobile speed cameras raises questions of revenue raising. 
Yeah, looks like I've been uh, somehow given the top three. I didn't elect that, but um, I've got the top three stories to, pre to present from the 1,000 or so stories that driven.co.nz runs in the calendar year. And uh, yeah, the hidden speed cameras, we all love a, a hidden speed camera. This was from New South Wales as well, um, which is a, a, an odd state. They've, they've tried to hide them. They've come back again. So they do actually have to put a sign on the road. Yeah to actually signify that there is a speed camera, but they put it within 50 metres, but obviously they don't put it before the speed camera, they put it after the speed oh, camera. Oh, that oh, works. Yeah. Oh my so you just goodness. go through going, oh, there's a speed camera oh, behind me that I've just gone through. So <laughs> that's a real nasty state. I'm happy to be out of it, to be honest. Uh, I'll give you an idea. I mean, a typical, like a, a low range speeding fine in New Zealand is $120, I, I, I think. Thankfully, I haven't actually, yeah. Thankfully, I'm, I'm I haven't. afraid I do know that. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, just ask Tony Street, she gets more than anyone. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to give you an idea, some parallels, and another reason why I, I was happy to move away from New South Wales, if you speed in the state of New South, New South Wales, 10 kilometres and over, the fine is, in Australian yep. dollars, $288. If you do 20 kilometres over, it's $494. Wow. If you do 30 kilometres over, it's $944, Ooh. plus three months instant suspension. Wow. And if you do 45 k's and over, which sounds a bit ludicrous, but if you're going through like a construction zone that's down at 30 mm. or, or, a, or a school yeah. zone that you haven't realised is 40 or 50, it could be 70 or 80 regularly, and you do 45 k's and over, so remember the 30 k and over was 944, 45 k's and over is $2,574 wow. plus six months suspension. Wow. wow. Just ridiculous. Well, like, I, don't know uh, I mean, in our system, it's the opposite side of that. You know, you'd get less than that for RAM rating, wouldn't you, in New Zealand? Probably, you know? yeah. 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 Slap on the wrist, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, nobody likes a hidden speed camera, and uh, but everybody loves reading about it. And number three story of the year. Number two on the list, the top 10 stories for 2022. The complete guide to the 64 warning lights on your dashboard. The Christmas gift that keeps on giving. Can you believe it? It's the um, the Christmas gift is is not the, the the headline part, but it is this. This is the most resilient story I think we've run in driven history. Driven's been going for this is our 11th year. We're about to tick over into yeah. 12. This story three years ago was number eight, top story of the year. Last year it was number three. Now it's moved into number two story. It's just about the complete guide to the 64 warning lights. Now, this is from 2017. This is a five-year-old story. It's now, amazing. I've been sitting on a surprise that none of you know. Hang on. <laughs> I tracked down the writer <laughs> of this story. Yeah. He is a Scot Scottish, England-based journalist called Anthony Joseph. Yeah. And he wrote the story. He's not a motoring journal. He's just a reg regular sort of normal news journal. Works for Sky uh, in the UK. I tracked him down and I had a quick Q&A and asked him about this story. So let's cut to some video now. Oh, a warm welcome to the writer of this infamous story, a Scot in London. Hello, Anthony Joseph. Thanks for taking the time. Hi, Dean. Yeah, thanks for having me on. <laughs> Did you have any idea about the longevity and popularity of this story in New Zealand? No. No. No, I mean, definitely not. Um, I mean, this was just a very much a kind of run of the mill story that I did. I, I, if I'm being honest, I don't even remember properly writing it. At, at Mail Online, you would very much be writing about seven or eight stories a day. And um, it's just crazy to think that that is one of the stories that has got a bit of legacy to it. But I can under, I, I mean, there's a reason why um, we did do the story, obviously, because they thought it would be um, interesting. It was basically saying that people don't know the, the signs and it was almost like, do you know these signs? And it's one of those kind of click, the stories that people click into, see if they do know them or and test themselves as well. So, Well, I guess the, you wrote this back in 2017, it. which is it's a lifetime. I mean, one year is a lifetime in the media. Um, where do you work now, and, and do you remember anything else about write, writing that actual story? Yeah, well, now I work uh, for Sky Sports News, um, still in London as well, but um, I'm a news editor here, and it's a very different type of job, um, working in TV and 
working on live TV as well and uh, in sports news coverage. And it's a 24 hour news channel, so it never, never stops. And uh, I'm, I'm mainly um, working football transfers and um, also lead our uh, coverage on our Hate Won't Win campaign, which um, covers about discrimination in sport as well. So it's, uh, yeah, very different uh, to the nature of my job, my previous job at Mail Online, which was you could literally have any story um, land on your feet that day, just depending on what was going on. But uh, yeah, I, I, again, I, I've got no recollection of the story. And when you got in touch, I just, yeah, I couldn't believe it. I was, uh, I was so surprised, but it made it made me laugh, and it's good. It was, uh, I'm glad it's it's uh, doing well. One of many hundreds, if not thousands, of stories done over the years since then, anyway. So, yeah. So it's. Uh, I think when I left, I was at Mail Online for about three years, three and a half years. And I think when I left, um, I checked how many stories I'd done. It was like six thousand. A couple of quick, quick rapid fire questions. Do you own a car in London? Yes, I do. Nothing uh, special. Uh, Citroen C3. <laughs> nice. That's not not too bad. Uh, do you have any warning lights that pop up on it ever? Um, I haven't yet so far. Like, actually, maybe a year ago, the tire pressure, um, the signal came up saying that your your tire pressure is low. That's, but that was uh, more on the screen rather than one of your, the the lights that you have to know about. <laughs> so I, I think I would struggle, but I guess now that I've been reminded that I wrote this story, if a light warning light came on, I'd probably go on Driven's website and uh, have a look at the story that I wrote. <laughs> You're the expert expert of your own subject knowledge. <laughs> uh, Not sure about it. <laughs> Anecdotally, do you have an ultimate dream car? Oh, I don't know. I think uh, I always want to... Well, I don't I can't say I always wanted to, but recently I've always wanted to have a Tesla, and I just think the the screen is pretty cool. I'm quite in, I quite like cars with nice screens on them, <laughs> and uh, like iPady kind of screens. But uh, yeah, I'm a long way from being able to afford to own one. Certainly, uh, if you have any more motoring story ideas in the pipeline, we could use. Um, I'm not sure that perhaps. Uh, Without knowing too much about your publication, perhaps uh, an idea might be to look at famous sports stars in their cars. Um, here in the UK, we've got um, Pierre Emerick Obama Yang. He's a footballer for Chelsea, and he loves his supercars. And he's got uh, quite an array of uh, cars. I would love to be able to tell you what kind, but I don't know. But I just know he's got lots of fancy cars and lots of the tabloid media do stories on this new car that he's driving things like that so i don't know perhaps a an idea for you guys on your the famous uh new zealand sports men and women and what they drive possibly yeah well uh, any stories you have you, you've got a special green uh, vip pass for, uh, for for running stories for us on driven so um thanks for your time anthony um uh, and i, I guess a, a sort of slightly odd congratulations yeah if you get another car story please let us know and uh, thanks for your time well, dude, no, thanks for having me on. Cheers. Outstanding Brilliant. research by yeah, Dino. Fantastic. Eh? Yeah, he was a great guy. Like not a not a car guy, as I said um, in the interview. Like uh, if he does another motoring story, please let us know. But uh... <laughs> did at any point he ask for a commission or a cut? I mean, I'd have been asking for a little rollback. No, he, he's quite surprised. Obviously, was he really? Yeah, to see it uh, so resilient mm. on, on driven.co.nz. Yeah. So um, we've well. never we've never republished it as such. I mean, it's always been live, <clears> but so we, we haven't pushed it again. It yeah. sat there as a resource. Yeah. Then. Yeah, well, I, I look forward to next year when it takes the number one spot. <laughs> That's exactly what I said. Uh, I thought it was going to be. It was, it was so. I, the reason I did the interview because it sat number one until the number one spot was taken over yeah, in the right. last month or so. So that's why I did the interview. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, maybe we will see it at number one next year. Yeah. We won't do another interview, but uh, yeah. yeah. And interesting, number one on the list, and it is a recent story. Um, and this surprised me. I cannot believe this is the most clicked and read story of 2022. Number one on the list is Hilux owner who paid $38,000 for his now worthless ute, accepts he may never get his money back. We only published, the remarkable thing about the story is that we only published this probably about one month ago. Yeah. So 7th of November, we published this story. And obviously it hit an accord with the readership. 
number one story uh, for the year by a mile. Now, it's, rather than just overview, I'll probably just read out the first paragraph. It is quite a long story, so there is more to actually be gained from. The owner of a now worthless Toyota Hilux that was built from multiple parts, including a stolen engine, has resigned himself to the possibility he may never get his money back. And he's not the only person to have bought a Hilux from the same dealer that has ended up in the Motor Vehicle Disputes Tribunal this year. In late 2020, Jeremy Jane paid 38 grand for this ute, which is now parked up, unable to be used after NZTA flagged it as unroadworthy because of the danger it presents to him and other road users. Wow. Um, it comes after Auckland man Jay Keophilia. Keophilia paid Vehicle Imports Direct Limited 45 grand for his Toyota 18 Toyota Hilux three years ago, only to later find out it had been in a serious crash and been mm. poorly repaired, leaving it with numerous faults. He was a builder and a keener hunter who liked to sort of use it uh, as, as you do. You buy a car like that to use. Yeah. Um, but 17 months and about 36,000 Ks later, he found out that 2017 Hilux uh, was built from composite parts, including a stolen engine. The case ended up at the Motor Vehicle Vehicles Disputes Tribunal, which instructed Vehicle Imports Direct Limited, the company he bought it from, to refund the $38,000. Unfortunately, by that time, despite the business still being registered, it was no longer trading, and the site was vacant. No longer trading. Who'd have thought? Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Why. The yeah. signage removed, telephone disconnected, emails unanswered. So there was a little bit of contact back and forth. Um, the owner did get in contact with the guy. It's all very, very messy. There is a long story up there. But um, yeah, buyer beware. Due diligence whenever buying yeah. a vehicle because it's it's a harsh and unfortunate lesson. But yes. there's plenty of um, dodginess. Yeah, dodgy Hilux. Go, going taking, on. Taking the number one spot for 2022. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, thank you to Honda as well for backing us in and sponsoring the show and making it possible. Uh, we really appreciate it, and we really appreciate your support tuning in each and every week. Um, Dean, I think I'm going to let you read this note here. If you slip that into my outro, I think it's something you're very passionate about. <laughs> yes, it is. I could just put those two words. <laughs> Keep left unless <laughs> passing. Uh, have a wonderful <laughs> summer. Be safe out there, and we'll see you with a brand new show next year. We can't wait. Have a great summer.